Morning or afternoon at this stage? I think we're bordering an afternoon and thank you all very, very much indeed for, for having me here today. Um, there's one question that is sitting in my mind since I came up, uh, up this morning and that is, what makes people great? What makes all those women that Jane referred to, including herself, fabulous? What is it that can drive somebody to get into the sea in Cuba and not stop until they get to Florida? What is it that can make an eight-year-old believe she can set up a business and then go on to create, I don't know how many amounts of revenue, sell all over the world in a green friendly way and believe she can do it. And actually, here at TEDx today, the answer has been already given. It is creativity, it is resilience, and it is identity. And I think those three things are really what can drive somebody's career forward. But in my introduction today, I was going to talk about five key ways to turbo boost your career, but before I get to that point, I think it's really important to consider, let's re reverse engineer the model and to think about your identity. What makes you, you? And I've often considered this over the years, and I've thought, you know, what makes me, me? But the thing is, I could never answer that, because what makes me, me, is so natural to me, I don't even notice it. Somebody else called me some, uh, somebody positive, I didn't realize I was at all. It's like saying, well, how do you breathe? I just do, like, you know, it just, just comes naturally. So the first question that I would ask you today is, what makes you different? What are all of the ways that could identify you, firstly, as a person? We'll get to the career part yet, but firstly, as a person. So, for example, there's a number of them up there, but one of the, one of the ones that I really, it really saddens me um, to hear people talk down is I was giving a presentation one day, and somebody, you know, I, as I was going around the room asking everybody um, to, to describe themselves, one woman put up her hand and she says, well, I'm a bit long in the tooth now. <clears throat> I'm a bit long in the tooth now, but I have 20 years experience in what I do. <coughs> and I said to her, do you know how many graduates would love to have that word experience behind them? Do you know how many companies would love to have the reassurance that you know what you're doing? I said, why would you talk that down? And I was really, really delighted to hear that lady th this morning talk about being at 60, she's at her prime. Because really, we're never too old. But equally, we're never too young either. And it's really, really important to think about what do we offer. If we're very young, we're fresh. If we are of a more vintage demographic, we're experienced. And it's always important about how you identify that. Also, Another topic, and uh, I think another area that is often under-described, is the whole uh, world of CSR. And CSR is corporate social responsibility. Now, as, as individuals and as business people, we're often asked to donate our time, our money, our experience, our skills, our, our contacts, or something. And rarely do you see that on a web page of a business. Because, of course, that's just what big corporates do. They have CSR departments, they have defined budgets and everything else. And yet, People buy from people. So I much prefer to deal with somebody who has a moral conscience, whether it's to deal with women's rights, whether it's to deal with equality, whether it's to deal with the environment or whatever. So if you do that, if you donate to charity, or if you put your time into a charitable or a moral cause, that is a branding in itself. So it's first of all so important to think about what do you, what do you stand for? So. Just as, as, as I've given those two examples, I really still couldn't answer that question. And I, you know, I used to think about all of these things and I used to say, okay, well, you know, what, what exactly is it that I offer? And then I found the answer, but it wasn't inside, it was outside. I had to listen. I had to listen to why other people wanted me as a speaker, wanted me as an author, wanted me as a business person, wanted to work with me, wanted to work for me. And one of the reasons they did is because I always focus upon what you can do. Always, 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 always. Now, as a trained economist, I was trained how to look at things we can change. Things like big, big numbers like GDP and national debt. And of course, we all have small ways that we can change these. But they're not really, really, really big chunks that we can break in through here. So I always focus upon what you can do. And one morning, I was on a, a, a radio station and um, it was 4FM and it was Gareth O'Callaghan was interviewing me and he's a, he's a very famous Irish broadcaster. So after I went in the first morning, they said, you know, 
we'd love to do a personal finance slot every Friday morning at half seven. And this is about five or six years ago, and I was delighted. I was saying, God, this is great. I used to get a fierce kick out of going into the radio and putting on the headphones and all that sort of thing. So I was bound in every Friday morning anyway at half seven, and um, one time they were all feeling really down. And of course, I came in all excited, and the recession was really digging in at this stage, and they said there is nobody could come in here and be happy on a Friday morning when GDP is down, unemployment is up, and the bond yield has hit the roof apart from a positive economist. So I went home that day anyway, and I said to Ardell, my fiance, um, I said to him, Gareth O'Callaghan called me the positive economist today. He said, why don't you secure the domain name? And that was that. All I did was listen, that was it. And the other thing is, and this is where it really is important, is it's also important of the courage of your convictions to stand for who you really are. And that is what identity is all about. Yes, it's easy to become somebody else. It's easy to watch other role models and wish you were them, but they've already done it no matter how good or no matter how great, there's space in the world for a new person to do whatever it is that you want to do. It's really important that you're willing to be you. Now, that was also, I suppose authenticity was something that came naturally to me because I don't know how to be anybody else. And it never occurred to me to be anybody else. And that was another thing people used to say to me, you're always very authentic. And I said, well, sure, how can I not be? I'm not quite sure how that would really work. And the other thing that people used to say to me is, well, everything you talk about is highly practical and implementable. And I said, but after all, if I come to a session like this, or I give a training course, or I attend a training course, what good is the theory? I've, I've, we can all look at that, but it's, it's what really happens in practice. And again, I didn't realize that that was something that not everybody else did. So that was my second one, was practical and implementable. And then the final one, and this is the absolute one I live by, is that I practice what I preach. I give training in the financial markets, but I invest in the financial markets as well. And I talk about what it's like when you borrow to go into the markets in 2008 and lose most of what you've got. What a great lesson it is for a start off investor, by the way. And I also know what it's like to have the courage of your convictions to go back in in April 2009 as well. And of course, it's been great since then. But I will not stand up and talk about anything that I haven't done myself because I can't. I simply wouldn't know what to speak about. And sometimes I've asked to speak about the most opaque things, and I always go back to those three core values. But also, I call them core values. I use words like objectives, and I use terms like KPIs, even though I have a business where I only employ four staff. I talk like a corporate, because that's where I want to be. And why do I have to wait until I employ 50,000 people in order to use those terms? So that's what I've done is in terms of identity, I have really listened to what other people have perceived how I'm different, and I've believed it, and I've done it. And moving on from there then, after you think about how you're different, and then how you uh, listen to how other people perceive that you're different, it's also important to speak, and to write, and to articulate how you're different. So, I have always done my own PR up until two years ago, and what I would invite you to do is think about how you can find your own voice. And I noticed actually that's the headline on, on the magazine at the, at the back of the, of the room today. How can you find your own voice? Well, the thing is, is that we're not a silenced nation. We're not a silenced gender. We have any amount of opportunities in order to speak. And yet, there's not enough women on, on media. There's not enough women in business. There's not enough women in politics. There's not enough women who speak out. Why? Why not? What's the worst that could happen? So what I would encourage you to do, and sorry, there is one thing that often holds people back, and, and uh, apologies to be frank, but that's only in your head, is that you think you've nothing to say. We all have something to say. We all have some, some of us more than others, but we all have something to say. So what, what I would encourage you to do is, for me personally, how I started off was number one, I started writing my own blog, which obviously, as I'm sure you can guess, was The Positive Economist. So I started writing on that first of all, and then I started approaching radio stations and TV stations about things that mattered to me. So if ever I spotted a trend or I noticed linkages or something that was shocking in the media that I had a view on, I used to send two line press release, no more. Media and journalists have very busy lives and they have the attention span of goldfish, deservedly so. Two lines, if you can't articulate your point in that, they weren't gonna take you on anyway. So what I used to do is I used to approach them, and particularly for me, the um, European debt crisis was something of, of immense um, interest to me and, and the way in which we were partaking in that. I was looking at that and a number of personal finance issues and things to do with entrepreneurship and how the recession was changing the economy, etc. 
So after a while, they started coming back to me and I started going on all of these different media channels. So News Talk and RTE and BBC, etc., etc. And then on top of that, I used to always back it up with social media, so Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. But I didn't just write my own blog because what I also did to find a new audience was I used to guest blog as well. Not used to, I still do. And one of them, for example, that I wanted to bring up to you today is the RBS slash Ulster Bank um, uh, Business Women Can. Now, if you want to start blogging, you don't even have to apply or get approved. You have to submit an idea of a blog post and then it will appear there afterwards, okay? So that's one. I write for Finance Malta. It's one of the areas that I, that I, one of the countries that, that I work in now as well. Um, I, I also am a columnist for the Irish Post, which is a, a paper for the Irish in London, well, in Britain. Um, I, I've done lots and lots and lots of guest blogging. So overall, through all of that, the thing is, is that when you do go on media or when you stand on a stage like this, you have a very, very finite time. The reason that I love to write is because I can make mistakes and rub them out and set them right again before the world sees it. It gives me time, again, to identify and to define myself. So I had to be creative about how I found my voice, but also what I would really, really urge you to do is treat it with utmost caution. I never tweet anything that's abusive or that's impulsive because when you tweet, the world listens or it has the chance to listen. So I've always been very, very clear about what I wanted to say and by writing it's allowed me to do that. And unlike actually what, um, what, what Jane said, somebody did tap me on the shoulder one time. And what I found is that serendipity to me has been extremely kind. One day I was on the media, again I was a woman on a show one time, and it was about something Lloyds Bank wanted to do with the shares that they had, um, sorry, that the government wanted to do with the Lloyds Bank shares that they had paid dearly for. So basically what they wanted to do was give uh, shares to every household in the country at a certain price. And the RTE, the national newsroom in, a, in Dublin rang me to come in and explain this to the nation and on top of that, explain whether it would work in Ireland in 30 seconds. So I did. And it was replayed again at six and again at nine and I went home and I thought no more about it. And two days later, Penguin Ireland rang me and they said, we're looking for a woman to write a book about personal finance. Would you be interested? Penguin Ireland is the big, well, Penguin in general is the biggest publisher in the world. They rang me, they knocked on my door. Serendipity works and karma work. The thing is though, so many people put together book proposals and send them in just to get rejected. This one knocked on my door. But it knocked on my door because of all of the times that I had spent blogging and being in the media and contributing my own voice. So often, I often think, when I look back at our three years in business, I've had to work really, really hard for the small successes and my five biggest clients knocked on my own door and came to me. Give to the world, just seems to give back. But it's so really, really important that you give to the world first in expectation of receiving nothing. And uh, it's also important, I think, to be resilient. It's important that if you get knocked down to get right back up again, and that's easier said than done. You know, we hear that all the time. We think, oh yeah, and on strong days, you can really do that. You know, on strong days, on the first seven sales calls, you get told no, on number eight, you'll, you'll strike gold, and you think, oh yeah, I can do this. And all the hard times are worth it. But there's sometimes when you just feel really, really, really down, and you just think, wouldn't it be easier if I took A, B, or C paths? And what I've done is a tiny, tiny thing. And it's actually, given that we're at the festive time of year, actually, it, it's kind of more uh, relevant at the moment. That is, every single day, in red pen, I write to the top of my diary something I've achieved. Now, some days that is launch a new book, sometimes that is get a new client, sometimes that is turn over X amount. But some days it is that I did the right thing. Some days it is that I made somebody else feel better. Some days it is that I just kept going. Some days it is that I had to get up at 4 a.m. this morning for a flight and I stayed awake all day. I didn't say, you know what, I'm going to give in to my tiredness and go to bed. I just stayed going. And on those days when I'm feeling like, oh God, wouldn't it just be so much easier if, if I could just take an easier route? I go back through those red marks on my diary so that I'm not, when we're all singing Auld Lang Syne in a couple of weeks, thinking, what was 2013 all about? Because it's important to notch the daily tasks. Because yes, we have seen immense achievements and I'm sure we're going to see many more again today. They didn't happen in 53 hours. They happened over years. And it's important to think about all of the ingredients that only you and I know about in our own personal journeys to get there. I always think of Muhammad Ali talking about, you know, people used to say, what's it like to be in the ring? And he said, I only come out here to dance under the lights. The real work is done in the back room. 
nobody ever cares about that. And that's the point, that is where the real work is done and that's where the achievements should be really noted down. One of the things I've really focused on to doing all of my career is to network within my network. And what I always do is think about ways that I could offer content to other people so that may, or I could give them opportunities so that they will, they will move on in their own career. And I really, you know, I have an understanding with Karma now. We, we, we get on okay. And I always think, well, if I help other people, they will help me back. But I don't start off with that expectation. I just believe in kind of a greater power that it'll happen. So one of those things is that if you are going to an event like today, it's always a good idea to ask other people if they might be interested in coming along because it gives you a couple of opportunities. The first thing is that you get to come and meet a new audience or new people or new contacts. But the second thing is that you get to reinforce existing relationships. And the third thing is it absolutely identifies you as different and somebody who, who, where your clients and your prospects and your contacts mean more to you than just normal LinkedIn contacts where, you know, we're all on them now. So if you're going to something, perhaps suggest somebody else might come along with you. And that definitely, I always do it. Every single event that I go to, I always think, well, who else might be interested in coming along? It costs me nothing, zero time whatsoever. Another thing I do is that I send them, if I've written a blog post on a certain topic, I send it on to them afterwards. And I said, you know, maybe we had a discussion about this at TEDx when I was in Belfast last week, might be of interest to you. And that's how I also boost the ROI of blogging. Another thing is that, well, I won't do this th at this month of the year, but I always send something to my clients when I get paid, every single time. If, the, if I have a retainer with them, I will send them something on our anniversary. I never send pre presents at Christmas because everybody else does. And if there's one thing I am, it's not everybody else. And another thing that I do as well is that I always say, you know, if there's business there to be done, just do it for somebody else. If somebody says, I'm really, really, really in dire need of getting a new business card designed, my own is just out of date. Well, if you have a good graphic designer, tell them and put, the, put them in touch with them. We all have a deep reservoir of connections and contacts at this stage. Simply make introductions. Doesn't matter if, if it doesn't really work out. I was one contact introduced me to 10 people and one of them could deliver me a five figure contract. The other nine, it was nice knowing them. But the point is that if she hadn't introduced me to any of them, nothing would have happened. You all have contacts. All, none of this costs anything. And the, po the last point I want to make is how to stop procrastination. Because procrastination is an absolute killer. And, and procrastination is the thing that allows us to think, I have lots of time in the future. I'm 27 and I am under no illusion as to how little time I have left. And I intend to live to 100 at least, you know. Um, me and Karma again. But the point is, is that I'm not 21. I'm certainly not eight, like that girl was previously anyway. And I am under no illusion of how much time I have left and how little time I've left at the same time. So here's how I stop procrastination and thinking, ah, it's all right until tomorrow. Or uh, hearing the excuse like, you know what, it'll be fine when things settle down, because they never settle down. And anyway, sure, why would you want them to settle down? This is my board meeting of the future, okay? So that's me at the top, we'll get rid of him. This is my board meeting of the future. They're tuning in from London, they're tuning in from New York, they're tuning in from the Sydney office, they're tuning in from everywhere. This is my board meeting of tonight. Me and Ardell sitting down over a Thai dinner every single Friday night that I'm in the country, this is what we do. And the reason that we do it is because three weeks after I set up the company, I was in tears in my office thinking, what about all these illustrious dreams I had of you know, multi-million revenue and all these staff and my glass ceiling office and all this type of thing. I said, you know, where, where, what happened all of that? Why am I running and running and running, bringing in as much money as is going out paying on everything else and I can't seem to get anywhere? And I rang him in tears and I said, you know, could we just meet tonight and I just want three things that I could do next week to really grow. So we did that Friday night and then I said, you know what would be great? Could you actually come back to me? Could we do the same next Friday night? I mean, he's my fiance, I could do this any night, but specifically on this, this Friday night, well he is now anyway, God bless him. Um, well, I have another nine weeks until he's a bit more. Um, so I had, a, and the next week we did, we met, but because I had that, that subtle date in mind of next Friday, the important took precedence over the urgent. And that is how we've grown, is because I have been willing to hold myself accountable. And accountability is so important. And there are lots and lots of ways of doing it. Plato Ireland, for example, is a, is a training course where you go every month. What I used to do is give myself the silent deadline that by the next time I went to Plato, my Plato meeting, I would have X, Y, and Z done. And what I would ask you to do is on the 6th of December, 
it's very easy to consider 2013 as nearly finished. Well, what I would ask you is, what is the one thing, just one thing you will do before this year is out to make it amazing? You have another three weeks left to accomplish it. Just one. No New Year's resolutions. We're far too early for all that carry on. Just one thing between now and the 31st of December that you will have done. So I'm going to finish by saying, you know, just keep going. Have that resilience that we hear all of these women having. And again, I, I do practice what I preach and I often say to myself, you know, I can't stand up and ask people to have the resilience if I don't have it myself. My, one of my, my own key role models is my five-year-old goddaughter. Because every single time when she was learning to walk, she got back up again. Every single time when she was learning to talk she, and we couldn't understand her, she kept going. Now, I can't be a godmother to her if I can't at least show the same leadership qualities that she already has in her young life. So at this point, as an economist, we're often asked to predict the future. But in my opinion, in the words of Peter Drucker, the only way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you. <laughs>